What is it? I think that it's unique. I think that's the only one of its kind in the universe. I think that that is... Hold to open. Hold to open. Yes, and what do you do? They're not clear. They're fuzzy. They're grey. Little moments in which big things are decided. And this is one of them. Honestly, do you have music playing in your head when you say rubbish like that? Here comes the drum! Hello, and welcome to Pull to Open, a podcast that is also an ongoing quest to watch all of the television series known as Doctor Who in completely random order. My name is Chris Taylor. And I'm Pete Paschal. Chris and I are a couple of guys, a couple of journalists, a couple of people who have lots to say about Doctor Who as a story, as a show, as a phenomenon. Yes, and we are also very definitely a couple of time travelers today on Sunday, March the 12th, <laughs> when we're recording this, uh, with the clocks having gone forward in a very timey-wimey kind of way. Mm. Um, but yeah. uh, I'd yeah. say we're a little bit in flux. We're a bit, bit in flux, yes. We just we just recorded our special episode, uh, which we talked about all of the shows that we visit and why we made the calls to combine and separate certain stories that may be slightly different from what you have in your own spreadsheets. Don't tell me you don't have a spreadsheet. Come on. Come on. I see you. I see you, Doctor Who nerd. Um, yeah, so but let's talk about where we were, where we've been on this random adventure so far uh let's zip back three episodes ago we were at the pertwee episode the mind of evil looking at a weird creature in a vat meeting the master when he was still a cigar chomping villain and uh seeing all of the padding inside of the prison there that was uh yeah perhaps not not our favorite pertwee i think it may be more of a favorite among people out there we were sort of surprised oh, by the, the listener yeah. poll on that fond and memories of that one lots of nostalgia memories lots and of speaking nostalgia. of nostalgia thank you for providing that link because two episodes ago we were at the destiny of the daleks which is for me the ultimate in doctor who nostalgia it's where i jumped on as a fan it's where we created our new rating the fixed point in time because i could not could not say it was bad also could not say it was good. It was just my nostalgia-filled introduce, introduction to the show. Therefore, it's a fixed point in time. Uh, <laughs> Luckily, and... even though you had the imagery of standing on like Silencio <laughs> and not being able to shoot the episode yeah. that brought you into the world of Doctor Two, I was right beside you with my gun. <laughs> And you (laughs) shot the doctor. You shot the doctor dead. Yep. Good job. Anyway. Except it turned out to be a Tesselector uh, version of Destiny of the Daleks. Anyway, (laughs) some spoiler alert there that you weren't expecting for the Weddings of River Song. Um, Anyway, from Destiny of the Daleks, we went rocketed forward in time to almost up to date at least the up to date doctor jody whittaker the orson orphan 55 uh technically not the up to date doctor but okay one one doctor ago <laughs> there was an actor named jody whittaker who played the doctor and she was an orphan 55 and we uh we did not really enjoy that um uh, managed to get through the entire podcast without calling it awful 55 though um oh wow which I, I suspect that might become its name in the future. Um, Just didn't and- occur to us, though. <laughs> like you with the wordplay a, we- a week late. But hey. And then after trashing Orphan 55 and saying, please get us the hell out of here, the randomizer really tested our love for the randomizer and our love for this <laughs> random journey by it's taking us. us. It's teaching us a lesson. Most definitely, I feel really schooled uh, by what the randomizer has done because it's taken us to series eight, episode seven, the infamous, as far as I'm concerned, and some fans are concerned, kill the moon. Yes. I have to even take a deep breath when I say the title. Oh my God. You got it out of you and you did it well. Mm. Guys, uh, before we get going, I want to let everyone know that if you want to jump right to our commentary on Kill the Moon, go ahead and check the show notes in your podcast app or if you're on YouTube, check the description and it will have the exact time when we start our commentary, which is usually when we do TLDW and we summarize the plot. So go ahead and check that out. And if you want to just fast forward to that, feel free. 
Indeed, and we we have a reason why we're we're cutting down our uh, feedback loop a little bit, uh, <laughs> and and giving you giving you a warning ahead of time uh, of when to cut to the commentary, uh, which I would say on average usually is roughly twenty minutes to half an hour. We're going to try and keep that down uh, from now we'll on. Tighten it up. Tighten it up. We'll tighten it up. But let's enter that feedback loop just so you know what everything that's going on in the world of pull to open. Yes. Listeners, if you enjoy Pull to Open, uh, we have our episode commentaries. We do our brain teasers of Doctor Who episode titles, which are in the form of emojis. Or if you just like the delightful randomness of our journey, we'd like to encourage you right now to please leave a review or rating in whatever podcast app you're listening in. Go ahead and pause the playback. We'll wait and we'll <laughs> still be here when you when you come back. Uh, reviews really do help the show. We love to sometimes read them out on air even. Uh, even better, we do. go ahead and share this podcast with a friend. And uh, for your really enthusiastic fans, if you want to leave an emoji title, which I mentioned earlier, in that review, that is a great, great idea and leads to some really fun segments that we have here at the top of the show. Yes, yeah, specifically an emoji title of a Doctor Who story. Right. Uh, and we're filling up the codex with them. You too can be part of that process. So, we, as I said, we sometimes read out reviews on air and we have a review and I would yeah. love to read it out right now. The title is too much preamble. <laughs> and this is from mm -hmm. the handle on Apple podcasts. Oh, you know, and Oh, you know, says the content of the actual discussion is always very solid, Thank but you. it takes far too long for each episode to get going. Just listen to their Waters of Mars discussion, and it took a full 30 minutes to get to the discussion. <laughs> I understand that engaging with your community and plugging other platforms and etc. are important for a growing podcast, uh, for growing a podcast, but I would strongly recommend either shrinking the preamble down or shifting some of it to after the discussion segment. I think it would make it a lot easier for me to get into the podcast and would certainly make the episodes more bingeable. As I said, the actual content is good, so I hope this isn't too harsh but the opening segments make it genuinely difficult for me to get into the pod. Hmm. And I would just like to respond to this review with mostly one word, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll elaborate. <laughs> yep. Fair. Yep. Fair comment. I am actually really glad we got this review and I'm glad this person left these comments and mm -hmm. gave the c criticism in a very constructive way. And honestly, like I know this sounds a little bit like we're self-flagellating and uh, maybe perhaps overreacting to a single piece of feedback. No, I thought about that. Uh, we've actually been feeling this for a little while and mm -hmm. you know, we either unofficially or with sort of a little bit of feedback from other people in our lives um, and it was this was a really good sort of kick in the pants, like, oh, yes, we really need to sort of tighten up our pre-show. Uh, so we're going to change some things around. So Chris and I were talking about it uh, before the show. So one, we're just going to tighten this period of the show up a little bit, just generally cut the things a little quicker. Uh, in our feedback loop, we know we love to read reviews. We love to do comments of the week. Uh, from here on out, we're only going to do one yeah. per episode, like either one review, one comment, or... You know, basically one piece of discussion that uh, from a previous episode that was left hanging, we'll explore it, and then we're done. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, as you probably heard just a couple minutes ago, at the start of every show, we will make a note to remind everyone of a new thing we're doing, which is that the time uh, code for when we actually start our commentary, which is TLDW, we're going to remind folks that that is in the show notes every single week. And we'll put it in the show notes every single week. So if you want to just do that and fast forward to our commentary on the episode of the week, it's going to be super, super easy for you to do that. Yes. Um, I will, I will I'll, I'll also that. say, let, let me just throw in that this is, you know, uh, to, to echo what Pete said, like we really appreciate reviews, constructive criticism, uh, reviews that have constructive criticism. And, and we do have a rating system for, uh, for every story in Doctor Who. One of those ratings is the Professor Hater, which is, we, you know, bad episode, but we learned something. I feel like this is a Professor Hater of a review of Pull to Open. And right. we, we have definitely learned something from it. So we really appreciate the feedback. So I, I'm going to say I, we reserve the right 
to go long when there's really right. big things going on. So, right. you know, sooner or later, there's going to be more Doctor Who made. There's going to be a little bit more to talk about. Again, we're going to really make an effort to keep it tight, not get lost too much into talking about individual comments and such. Uh, but we, you know, once once things really start to happen, we have things to say that we think bring something to the conversation. We might go a little longer uh, normally. Again, we're always going to have oh. that note. If you want to cut to the commentary, you can. You just got to check the show notes, find the time code, and jump. Yeah. Uh, so after these alterations, I, you know, hope, oh, you know, uh, <laughs> if you can, if you don't mind going back into your review and maybe putting an edit uh, and perhaps altering your star rating. Thank you for the three stars. I think it's still good. And I really liked that mm -hmm. you enjoy the commentaries. We're going to continue to do those. Um, uh, but again, thank you for the feedback. And if you care to uh, give us more feedback once we've made these alterations, uh, we'd really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, let us, let us skip forward to talking about Spotify, where you too can rate the individual episodes that, and stories of Dr. Who that we're covering. Yeah. Every we week. have a new rating. We have a new rating, so you can give your own rating, whether it's Dalek, Ogron, Viscount Banger, uh, Professor Hater, or even a fixed point in time. And we have results for Destiny of the Daleks, which mm. I think are very meaningful for you, perhaps, Chris. So yeah. the one yeah. that one out was the Professor Hater. Yeah. It's a 44%. Now, if you recall, I gave that one an Ogron, which is about 33% here. Mm. Uh, some people thought it was a Dalek. Some people thought it was good. It's 11%. Some people, yeah, they, they found redeeming things in it. Yeah. And But you also had a good chunk of people like yourself that consider it a fixed <laughs> point of time. 11% of the voters mm. thought yes. that as well. I get Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, people. Thank you, fellow uh, 1979 veterans um, for <laughs> uh, thinking <laughs> along with me that you just, you can't, you can't hate on this. You can't. It just is. It just exists. Um, no, yeah, nor should you, but I will. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I've done it. I've I said what I had to say about Destiny of the Daleks, uh, and I do. You know, there, there's some stuff in there that's that's okay. It's just they yeah. get some things way too wrong. Yeah, Professor no Hater. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Professor Hater is a good good uh, outcome for that. I think I'm I'm satisfied yeah. with that result. Best possible future. Mm. So, uh, moving on in the feedback loop, we are obviously on YouTube. Please follow us there at youtube.com slash pull to open. Even if you follow uh, the podcast on a podcast app, it would really help if you subscribe there. You get to see all these fun little Easter eggs that we have in the background. Look at this stuff, guys. <laughs> you can tell what's going on here. Uh, I'll describe all of them later. They're all a little, not all of them, but most of them are kind of relevant to the commentary today. Uh, and if you are watching on YouTube, here's your reminder to like this video down there. There's a little thumbs up. Go ahead and hit that. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. And please hit the bell icon if you want notifications for whenever we have new content. And I will say on the subject of Easter egg, this is perhaps the only Doctor Who story for which saying Easter egg is itself an Easter egg. Oh, the egg thing. nature of the story. <laughs> I should have some eggs in the background. Damn. Yeah. Wonder why I didn't think of that. Yeah. Have some eggs that are getting really, really heavy for no <laughs> apparent reason. And it's funny. I saw something rotten last night. I should have, you know, I should know. <laughs> eggs. Duh. Eggs. Okay. Eggs. Guys, we are most active in terms of social networks on the social platform known as TikTok for as long as it's with us. <laughs> we are at pull to open all one word on TikTok. Please follow us there. We post short videos almost every day and all of our plot summaries are there um, that you can sort of follow along, like and share with people on the platform so check that's us right out and you, you can like like i often do when i go check them just just see what what's gone viral it, it's often just kind of fascinating to get a sense of we can never predict it in advance what is going to resonate with a tiktok audience it's fascinating yeah which moments from which episodes do you think were the most interesting cool it's not what i would think half yep. the time you know like <laughs> it's something weird like rose not having a face in the idiot's lantern yep. suddenly <laughs> becomes the thing everyone remembers from their childhood, which is like, oh, interesting. I love it. It's such a great way to find out like what, what made everyone else hide behind the sofa in the way anyway. that I hid behind the sofa from Davros. Yeah, and it's just super fun to go to our TikTok 
uh, I find it fun anyway, to go to our mm -hmm. TikTok profile and just scroll up and see all the sort of videos uh, that we've done. There's quite a few mm -hmm. now. Someday I'll count them. Someday I'll announce how many there are. <laughs> that is not today because we need to talk about Twitter and Instagram super briefly because we're at pull to open 63 on both of those platforms. Twitter is a great place to leave us a line. You can also send us an emoji Doctor Who title there as well. Uh, or just, you know, let's just talk about what everyone's talking about on Doctor Who Twitter. We're into that. Nice. All right. All right, and we've done it. Uh, roughly 15 minutes in <laughs> to the recording. Gotcha. We're, we're done with the feedback loop. There we go. Instant <laughs> feedback. We do like to be a very responsive podcast, a very uh, integrated and, uh, uh, you know, uh, choose your own adventure kind of uh, podcast. We do like to be uh, have a dialogue with the audience. So that's what, yeah. we're, that's what we're doing. And boy, are we going to have a dialogue today because... With yep. Kill the Moon, I think we should recognize right up top that while we may have problems with it, I've I've read a lot of reviews of people who really loved it. Um, so I okay. feel like this is going to be a controversial one. Well, I wonder if any of that <laughs> stuff is going to be in the plot summary that we get. Yes. What a, what a segue. Uh, yes. Each week we do TLDW, Too Long Didn't Watch, Too Long Doctor Who. Uh, or in this case, I think we might rename it TL ah, um, <laughs> for kind of the response of watching it. Um, and this turn, yeah. this time, it is the turn of Pete Paschal to right. summarize Kill the Moon. We give one minute per classic episode, so that's what you've got. I do not envy you on this one. I don't envy me either, but you know what? <laughs> Let's do this. I've, I've put all my tabs and windows have disappeared i'm looking at yep. a blank desktop i'm ready to get through <laughs> yeah. this tldw summarizing the plot in one yep. minute because that's what we allocate for every new who series episode and uh, by the way i was just looking at this not to get on a digression right off the bat uh, some people out there are saying we've got to stop calling it new who because it's not new anymore mm, and that point yeah, so I I don't know what else to call it though. It's, it's just such helpful shorthand. Uh, you, know, you know, I do, should we stop calling it New York uh, since it's not uh, been New Amsterdam for four hundred years? Very good. Right? Yep. I mean, I did go. I went to a university where we have a new college, which was from the fifteenth century. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just you know, new new is just a dividing line. You know, if you want to call it New Who with an N U. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just to, that's even know, better. Though, right? That's more of a more of even more of a differentiator. It's it's like exactly. not new per se. Yeah, so let's just keep it there. Let's just, just keep it off the tongue. I like it, it's fine. Um, but yeah, that that is uh, our last digression <laughs> before we plunge into it. I well, do I love that way. I successfully stalled for another minute. So <laughs> I did. I love that when you close all the tabs. By the way, Pete, your your room just starts to glow this kind of red, orangey glow. Because <laughs> I have it, I've got the default <laughs> uh, background from God. What's this? Uh, it's Catalina. No, what is it? I forget which one it is. Uh, what the, the latest Apple? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know the one you mean. It's sort of got this wavy, sandy thing going on. Yeah, um, it's got yeah, whatever it is. It's yeah. something. <laughs> well, hopefully that's going to remind you of Lanzarote, uh, mm. the the setting for much of kill the moon and uh perhaps the reason why we were taken there because we asked for no more quarries and the mischievous randomizer said no well how about some lanzarote uh not technically a quarry i'll give it that not you know? a quarry we just sneak it in <laughs> all right so let okay. without further ado we're gonna do the official pull to open summary of kill the moon in one minute starting in three two one go so claire is at school she persuades the doctor to tell courtney who he said that she wasn't special to make her feel special to do so he goes to the moon but he goes to the moon in 2049 and they're actually on a space shuttle that's landing on the moon it's full of nuclear weapons uh what's going on here well it turns out the moon is actually kind of growing its mass anyway it's getting bigger and it's wreaking havoc on earth so they've come to destroy the moon they're going to blow up all these nukes to blow up the moon that will hopefully save the earth 
And so what the moon, doctor discovers after encountering these weird spider things, which are actually germs, is that the moon is an egg and there's a giant creature inside the moon that's growing and the gravity is similar to Earth. So it becomes this terrible choice. Do we kill the creature to make sure it doesn't hatch or do we not and let it hatch and see what happens? The doctor bows out. He just leaves in the TARDIS and leaves Clara and the last astronaut and Courtney to decide. And they ask Earth and Earth decides to kill it. But Clara at the last second says, don't. She puts the board button. The thing hatches. Earth is fine. Clara is still mad at the doctor for bowing out at the last minute. And there it is. Yeah, you just about <laughs> squeezed it in there with Clara being mad at the doctor. Uh, yeah, I, I might have th- also thrown in the other part of the denouement, um, which is, you know, Danny, Danny Pink saying you, you can't basically you can't break up with him until you can say all this and not be angry at him at ah. the same time. Um, yeah, yeah. I uh, good job. Thank you. It is it is so easy to get sucked into rabbit holes if you have a lot of issues with the story. I think, and <laughs> I could, I, I, I could to throw in some adverbs and adjectives. And, yes, uh, I, I could see you going in that direction when you called the spiders. When you said that the spiders are bacteria, which is one of the things that irked me. Yeah, as well. I wanted to sort of say inexplicably. Yeah, a bunch of times. <laughs> that was probably the thing, the adverb I was going to put a lot in, but no, it's there's. Yeah. Uh, Inexplicably, the moon is gaining mass. Inexplicably, there's a creature inside the moon. Inexplicably, the moon has been an egg all along. Uh, inexplicably, the moon is only 100 million years old. Uh, <laughs> it's just so it's just, it's perfect. many, <laughs> many things. Now, I, I want to say right up front that, you know, I, I feel like that, that there are going to be two uh, kind of tribes of Doctor Who fans on Kill the Moon. And one of the tribes is going to say, what's the problem, right? Doctor Who has always been fantastical. Like it it is a show that starts off with the premise of a police box being bigger on the inside than on the outside. But the the thing is always like, not always, but it's often just really big and basic and conceptual. Yes. Not, Not accurate. That's the thing, is that we're here with perhaps more than any other uh, Doctor Who, leaving aside uh, Terminus, uh, mm-hmm. which we'll, we'll get to, we'll get to that. The entire universe being we have to. <laughs> created by a spaceship uh, fuel dumping, right. um, but that that is like a tiny, tiny plot point in in a wider story. Here, it is the entire plot, and it's very hard to get past if you just like it it's so hard to turn off i i think this this is what i say on the other side here we're not here just being sticklers for science right it is very hard for me and i suspect for you as well pete to turn off your brain to the point where you can accept everything that we're being told here and i will just say it's not all about the moon it's not all about the science of the moon itself Mm -hmm. there are other issues here um I will bring up one, which is that this episode sort of seems to suggest that the Earth is flat and is all in night at the same time, right? Because right. Clara asks the Earth to vote by turning their lights on and off, which, first of all, why wouldn't you just do a Twitter poll? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's 2049. Yeah, I know the Earth is in turmoil with tides being changed or whatever. Like, let, let's go with that. But you know, uh, just yeah, not all the Earth is going to vote. And yeah. what if it's just night over the Pacific Ocean, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd right. get to vote here on the West Coast, but uh, the majority of the planet wouldn't. So just that is another thing that makes no sense. So I just want to give you a heads up as we continue this discussion. It's not all going to be science about the moon itself and why that doesn't work. Um, yeah, yeah, my... My issue with that, it, there's a few issues with it. So we can start there on turning off yeah. the lights because, yes, yeah. you're right. It's You'd only get half the world. Now, they are up there for a number of hours, and you see the numbers counting down. So presumably – It's it's one hour. From start to finish. Oh, is it only one hour? Yeah, that's oh, yeah, the thing. Like, it's only like 90 minutes or something. Yeah. yeah. So, no, you're right. It isn't even that long. And that, that also makes me think the – uh, I, I just don't think like, like, again, this is stupid to even criticize it, but I don't think there's enough engineering uh, to, like to turn off all the lights in an area like New York, London, Paris, wherever you go. Like, 
I think that you couldn't just flick a switch. Like you, you yeah. just couldn't like, I mean, it would, it would take days to even figure out how to do that. I think. And what about uh, streetlights? <laughs> well, you know? I mean, presumably they just shut them all down, right. From some central location. But I mean, I, I don't think, again, I'm not a city engineer. Someone probably is who's listening. Let me know. <laughs> but I, I think if someone, if basically the United States, let's just keep it simple as one country, the hmm. United States wanted to shut down all the lights in the country within let's even give it more time. Let's say it's 24 hours. Yeah. You know, could you do it? Could you even do it? Like every single light, every light source so that it's only like very tiny, like, you know, torches or whatever. Could, could you actually shut it down? I don't think you could. I think the engineering involved in the organization involved mm. it would take weeks just to figure out how to do it. I, I've seen some, some headcanon in reviews here suggesting that it's actually governments themselves who are voting. Because the way that you see the lights go out does seem to be very kind of region yeah. by region, country by country. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that into account, though. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, the government says shut it down. Like, could I, mm. I suppose you could just go right to the power. It'd probably be pretty, pretty quick. But it, like all of them, really? Yeah. Um, and also, how many people would die as a result of suddenly shutting off all the power? Like, it's right. Clara Oswald, because she doesn't know how Twitter polls work. Um as this has basically doomed people to die oh. in like car crashes on roads and uh, and the like you and know do you think at some point they say you, they they can't receive a transmission they can com- they can transmit but not receive so but this they, is the only way they can communicate the with them or dude yeah. at mission control like he isn't he on twitter or whatever the you know 2049 equivalent it, is like i i it could have just been throwaway my i felt like that wasn't as much of an issue for me that they couldn't just, they couldn't just call them back up. So I'll, I'll give mm. them that, that for some reason it was one way. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, yeah. if that well, had the been other, the only it, thing, yeah. if that had been the only thing we could overlook it. Right. Well, I think I, I have one, his, more his, yeah, one more nitpick here. One more nitpick here is which mm-hmm. is not really a nitpick. The, the other thing was kind of a nitpick. You could dismiss mm-hmm. like whatever they just did it. The engineering's mm-hmm. fine. And I'll go with it for the story. I, I just think it's just too simple. And I hate these kind of resolutions to nuanced topics that clearly have two different points of view and two cases to make on either side. And the, the you know, group on one side goes all in on one thing. And mm. they're trying to make it really dramatic, but it's like, that would never happen. You're not, you're going to have some dissenters. You're going to have some people that mm. say, no, don't do that. Yeah. And I, I, I'm struggling to remember one, but I, I, one of them does occur to me, which is sort of at the end of, I think it's the first or second season of Star Trek Voyager, and Janeway gives her crew, if anyone wants to stay and here at this planet we found, and not you know like basically be safe and you know you can and we'll we'll set you up, and she goes to she says come to the cargo bay and we'll will beat me down or whatever she goes there and no one shows up basically everyone's mm. on for the journey and i'm like really not one mm. <laughs> like you know it's kind of like the, it would be kind of cool to see like at least one person or like i don't know i know they were trying to make some other dramatic point in that episode but again it is like yeah. you're, you're, you're doing this dramatic yeah. exactly you're doing this dramatic point where it just strains credulity to like think that it's just so uniform yeah, yeah. Where every literally everyone is voting this way. No one is going to leave their lights on. No country is going to decide to uh, to not kill the moon. Like, like and- not even Canada. <laughs> Canada's so nice. Maybe, maybe Canada. Maybe this is the issue that we're discovering. To go back to dinosaurs in a spaceship, that the Canada is actually really small in the future, and that the breakup happens before <laughs> twenty forty nine. So uh, all that maybe. niceness just goes out the window. Yeah, it's you know, and again, we could we could overlook this. Here's here's how I felt watching Kill the Moon, and I did have to watch it in five minute increments, uh, just because my my blood boils throughout this story. It felt to your point, Pete, last week about Orphan Fifty Five. You said you felt like Chris Chibnall was coming out of the TV and whacking you over the head. <laughs> still have the bruise. Uh, I still have the bruise. I feel like I was with Kill the Moon. I'm watching it again. I, I did. I did like a lot of it better. Like uh, I'll, I'll say that. You know, we we do try to be positive and positive. There are bits I liked better. Loved the opening. Loved the Um, You know, liked it. Liked it somewhat better throughout. Uh, and it does have an excellent speech by Clara at the end. We'll get to that. Mm. Um, 
you know, so it's not all hate, but it did feel like I was sitting in front of my TV watching a, a good, a good episode, you know, a fairly decent episode of Doctor Who, but that just every so often Peter Hunnes would step out of the television and hit me over the head with an iron skillet. <laughs> and then disappear and then and i'm just sort of kind of dazed but i'm like still trying to watch this really good episode of doctor who and then he does it again yeah and, and then he I does think, it again i think it's, and it's, it's it the doctor right <laughs> yeah the, the doctor is one of them i mean we we got to get the, the fact that the doctor takes off here i get that it's sort of important for the overall arc of the season but let us not forget the one thing that we've always been told about the doctor the one thing that has become sort of the doctor's creed it is mentioned in day of the doctor is that he is never cruel or cowardly right and this is kind of both mm. right and i get mm. that we sort of have to get there for clara to to leave him or, or to, you know to threaten to slap him so hard that he regenerates which is a great line mm. um i get that but like is there a way that we could do this without him also coming across as cruel or cowardly, which is basically what it is, because it's sort of revealed at the end that he did know what was going to happen all along, hmm. uh, which begs a whole lot of other questions. <laughs> like maybe he could have explained what this whole, what this creature is and whether he's seen them before and, and all of that. And that he <laughs> lied when he said it was a gray point in time. Is that is that really what happens though? I, I kind of thought it was very unclear to me that he he does say when Claire is lecturing him that he's he didn't know, like he still claims I, I really didn't know, hmm. but his speech before that feels like he should have, and he yeah. did right, like because he yeah. has this whole thing. This happens now, uh, and and humanity goes forward is inspired by this creature, and now they last till the end of the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, well, how do you know that you know like and she calls him out on it i mean do we want to start there with that whole like dichotomy yeah. and like yeah. what, what? I, I will also say yeah. that this is what you're doing with that speech is you are making this you, you're making kill the moon uh it unmissable in terms of your entire doctor who canon like yeah. you're saying this is the pivot point uh, right. That takes us out into the stars, even though that was sort of already with the waters of Mars. Said yeah, that. <laughs> already. T- yeah, like nope, forget about that. And I, I guess I'm I'm kind of glad that the randomizer brought us here uh, so soon after waters of Mars to make that point, perhaps mm. to to let us deal with that that confusion. Now we we know that Doctor Who canon is a mess. We get it. Um, but like, is is do you have to mess it up even further, like this? And do you have to mess it up over over a plot point that is so un, so fundamentally unbelievable, so hard yeah. to get on board with? Like you know, and we'll, yeah. we'll get into this. But there are there were ways around it. There are ways of not just writing this so lazily, especially if it's going to be so crucial to the entire show. So yeah, do, how does he know? Uh, I don't know. How, how does the doctor know any of this stuff? It's, he, he does sort of seem to have an ongoing self-updating history of humanity in his head. Yeah, I guess maybe that's it. And maybe it's seen beyond time. I don't know. They don't, they don't spell it out enough. This is where like, it just feels like a bit of a mess at the end. And even though mm-hmm. I think Jenna Coleman's the lecture to him, like she delivers it on an emotional level, you get it. But I I it did I don't know maybe I'm just dense I it wasn't <laughs> filling in enough blanks I was like wait a minute did he know or didn't he like I honestly didn't know at that point like I it w- would it not have been better served if he actually owned up which he doesn't seem to do in that yeah. final scene and he's sort of uh, defending himself a bit but still knows he's done something wrong or sh- he's done something to. Um, anger this person that he cares so much about hmm. so and, and also yeah. if if his stated reason is he wants to peace out and let the human race decide this on its own like that that whole point is undercut by the fact that clara is herself undercutting the the, the democratic decision you know yeah uh, is that the democratic decision of earth we can debate that we've, we've got into that a little bit um but it, but then she says, you know, screw democracy. You know, I'm hitting the button. I'm not letting this creature die. So, yeah. like, it's undercut upon undercut. And, you know, uh, so, like, why 
wouldn't he just tell them? Why wouldn't he be an advisor, uh, an outside advisor to Earth? Yeah. Like, it just like he said the thing yeah. like at the end, That's I know true. that eggs, hatching animals don't usually destroy their nests. Hmm. As sort of a halfway measure of like, I did. I didn't know this, but I do know some basic stuff around, you know, hatching or whatever. And right. this is that that. Well, you could have mentioned that, you know, yeah. and you could have been more part of this action, and you didn't necessarily have to literally leave to leave everyone to their own devices. Like, if you truly didn't know, like, why why did you even like why did you need to actually physically go hmm. when you're leaving the decision up to others, right? Yeah. Um, and honestly, like in Doctor Who, uh, <laughs> they've sort of done this a little bit. I'm trying to think of Pyramids of Mars, like where you, he kind mm-hmm. of goes to the future. He could sort of technically check what happened, yeah. <laughs> and, like check some history books. That's and then the other right thing. Back, yeah. Oh, you know what happens? And it's like, and I know he's, he, he can and he can't, right? Like, I mean, there's the, we could argue the Blinio Vigil Innovation effect, but it's also like that would definitely undercut what he's trying to do because then without the future knowledge they they he has to make them make the decision the dis- like in other words you can't do the bootstrap paradox here where right. no one ever makes the decision like that it has to come from somewhere it other has than to come from somewhere knowledge. but the the other thing the doctor could do and and would be normally a a much more doctorish thing to do he could if he's going to skip off like where does he even go that time? He could right. he could be researching this. He could go to some far off library, maybe the library, and uh-huh. look look into like what this creature actually is, right? Uh, you know, and 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 research the hell out of it, and you know, come come back with like a new Wikipedia entry or uh, something about like how this works. It's 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 like you know he's so again remarkably incurious we said this about you know the mind of evil versus dinosaurs on a spaceship right super curious about the dinosaurs being on the spaceship because that's very doctorish like he's very curious about creatures he encounters etc etc and um and and he's just not here uh just as in in mind of evil that stopped us right that he's not curious about this new life form that's maybe created inside the machine that the master is using to suck evil yeah. impulses out. Um, yeah, I just well, yeah, do, do again, some I'm, bloody research. I don't language. think either of us are, are the, um, the defenders of this episode, but uh, people do defend it. And, yeah. you know, I you do have to admire the boldness of it. And I feel mm-hmm. like Capaldi's first season has a lot of this sensibility. And we already did In the Forest of the Night. Yes. Which I think is very similarly structured with a very, um, you know, different concept, but it is of this scale, right? Like the the trees grow all all over the world overnight to make sure, you know, the world isn't incinerated by a solar flare. In this case, the moon's a giant egg and there's a big creature. And it's like, and I think the the director of this episode, uh, I got to look up his name one second, is... um, Paul Wilmhurst. Paul, Paul Wilmhurst. Yeah, Wilmhurst, Paul Wilmhurst. Yeah. And he, I actually listened to the commentary that he had on this episode on the mm-hmm. DVD, and he said it's um, uh, bonkers, basically boldly, <laughs> boldly bonkers. Uh, or no, that's not quite it. It's uh, um, <laughs> boldly going. Fearlessly no bonkers. Doctor Who fearlessly episode bonkers. has gone before. Yeah, yeah, fearlessly bonkers. Okay, uh, which is yeah. like it kind of goes for it. And it, again, you have to sort of admire it for that. Um, and they kind of do like try to explain certain things on like say why why wouldn't like yes it's eggshell not rock supposedly but again why wouldn't eggshell hit the earth right <laughs> like even uh-huh. if it, like why does that disintegrate uh, which is like the, there's just thing after thing after thing you just kind of have to w- it's hand wave away like if you're going to boldly do it yeah. it's not like doing the bold move entitles you to hand wave everything yeah you really still have to earn it right and bold, they just don't don't even come halfway on a lot of these things bold does not equal careless right there uh, you go Instead which of is sort of what he seems to be saying here and i will bring since you mentioned the director let's talk about the writer peter mm-hmm. harness now we have i don't know if you knew this pete we uh, on pull to open we now have a peter harness bingo <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> because... <laughs> That's right. We got him. Cue the balloons. Uh, no, he, he also wrote the Zygon Invasion, Zygon Inversion. Uh, right. And he co-wrote the Pyramid at the End of the World. So we, we are done. Got all those. With, we're done with Peter Hannes, but I think that you can start to see a theme developing between all of them, which is that we had a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. With Zygon Invasion, Zygon <laughs> Inversion, like we zeroed in on the fact that there's a great speech probably yeah. written by Moffat, inserted in the middle of that, but everything around it is like, huh? Huh? What? Hey, uh, how does this work again? Like, the Zygons just want to... The Splinter Group wants to kill all the Zygons by putting them in war with the humanity. How does that work? You know, and and uh, Pyramid at the End of the World, you're like, what? China, the US, and Russia are all at war, and uh, all here in this... Like, there's so much stuff to get over in your head, to, to, to uh, so much disbelief to suspend in yeah. all of these cases that I don't think that we fully could in any of them. Yeah. And I think in this one, it's even stymied more like they chose 2049 as the year. Yeah. And then they make these weird choices like the Mexican space agency being there 10 years earlier. I, I got to say like, I, 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 th- I have some sympathy and even like some of these choices. So by putting it mid 21st century, Mm. They seem to be challenging themselves, and I'm sort of including both Harness and Moffat here, to reconcile this with what we know about future Doctor Who history. And mm. they seem to be implying that Earth's, Earth's in a bit of a state. It's not its, its best mm-hmm. time, you know, in the novels and certainly some of the future episodes that we saw, like um, back in the Troughton days, uh, whether it's Seeds of Death or what have you sort of portray earth as this not not dystopia but things haven't gone that great you know there's there's pollution there's social unrest um and honestly this one in terms of its view of how humanity has treated space travel really really aligns with seeds of death because in both of this and that episode they're basically humanity's lost interest we're not we're not explorers anymore yeah Um, that that part hits home for sure Yeah. yeah we're just kind of looking inward and um which is which works, uh, but it, the problem is we're we're closer to twenty forty nine now hmm. than we were when it was seeds of death, and to sort of th- think of try to reconcile that with what we know is twenty twenty two. Again, this was you know almost ten years earlier, but still, like we're in the twenty first century already. And I will say, the Mexican part isn't totally nuts, even though it hmm. feels a little weird. There, and there which is, is a Mexican, there's a Mexican mining uh, mission. Right, as a Mexican, yeah. that had had apparently fallen victim to the spider germs, mm. and this would have happened in 2039 because it has been uh, it was for, from 10 years earlier. Mm. But right around the time this was broadcast, around 2010, Mexico did announce it was creating its own space agency. Now they don't mm. have rocket capability, even mm-hmm. though they're because of their proximity to the equator on Earth. It, that's actually not a terrible thing they to do for Mexico if they were to undertake that, but. They, uh, you could theoretically, if they work with partners for launching that, you know, you might have, you might have a Mexican team, right. But Mm. it felt, it felt just very weird to do that. Um, and you know, there's just, I don't know, like the last space shuttle that they came out of a museum. And they also sort of say that the, uh, these are the last nuclear weapons on earth, which just felt like really, wait a minute, like Mm. you didn't have to do that on top of every, like it, everything just it, card after card, they're playing of this sort of future earth society just feels wrong compared yeah. to what, what we kind of know of, of the, of the world right now. Um, it's very, very weird. Very weird. And so it. much of it is told through Hermione Norris's character. By, by the way, she is, she's a great, great actor. No, no notes on her. She plays the character Lundvik, who is sort of uh, explaining why everything's gone wrong back on Earth. And so much of it is telling rather than showing. And I guess that you have to do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, it's not really, uh, I, I get the notion that, you know, we, we kind of, we have kind of lost interest in space I get that, but it's not actually accurate. And it wasn't even accurate then to say that, that nobody was going back to the moon. I actually did a story as part of my series, Dear 22nd Century. Maybe we can link it to the show notes. Uh, mm-hmm. It's called New Moon, what the, the lunar uh, landscape will look like in 100 years. 
and uh, I do go through everything that is already planned. Now, uh, China uh, has already got the the first spacecraft on the far side of the moon. I wouldn't say obviously, but you know that's <laughs> if you've been mm-hmm. following moon news, you know that that China is very much involved. They've got. Uh, a uh, return mission uh, planned for, I believe, later this year, 2023. Uh, okay. There's a plan for Lunar Palace 1 um, that's supposed to be starting in 2025. Uh, India is uh, throwing up uh, its own lunar explorer. Uh, Chandrayaan 2, uh, I believe, is the is going to deliver the Vikram lander and the Pragyam robot. Uh, the European Space Agency wants to build a moon village. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, there's uh, yeah. an Israeli startup. That, that You've convinced through, me. You've yeah. convinced me. <laughs> a lot, I, of, a lot I, of interest in going to the moon again. Here is an uh, actual real-life uh, plot that sounds like almost something like out of Kill, to the, Kill the Moon. The, the Israeli lander that went up there had tardigrades on it, um, oh. I, I interviewed a guy named Nova Spivak, who was the one who put, t- it, they, they were actually smuggled on there. He didn't tell anyone they were on there. He was sending a, a disc with, I think, all of Wikipedia on it, but he also managed to smuggle in some tardigrades. Nice. Uh, if you know tardigrades, they're the sp- they're you know water bear creatures. We know they can survive in radiation. They can survive in space. They are on the moon right now. There's actual life on the moon uh, at the, <laughs> oh, no, at the spot no. where that lander crashed. Now we know where the spiders came from. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be interesting, right? Um, so yeah, you know Jeff Bezos is is talking about going to the moon by the end of the decade. Like right. this is uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. already out of date, yeah. and I'm pretty sure it was out of date when it was recorded. Yeah, and so it is, again, you don't have to reconcile what Doctor Who's vision was of the future with the the current thing that you want to do, right? You know what I mean? Like, in other words, Mm -hmm. like, it feels like a different universe. And I think Doctor Who is always stronger when it feels like our universe. And yes, it's important to respect continuity, but not to the point where you're alienating the audience. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at, where it's like, well, yeah. this doesn't just, just doesn't resemble the 21st century that we know. And it, it can't, it's this, we're not doing Watchmen. Doctor Who isn't Watchmen. Okay. <laughs> like it, it's not some weird alternate timeline. It's our earth. And yeah, they, you know, ex- have experimented with alien invasions being public and whatever. And we, we've already talked about that and we'll probably will continue to, um, but it should feel like contemporary earth. And so, uh, you know, references are fun, uh, but not to the point where it really hampers your story, and it and definitely does here. And you, you do have to think of the whole of, of Doctor Who history that you've established. You know, we, we've talked about um, on Paul to Open before the importance of being very yes and yeah. when it comes to Doctor Who. And this is not yes and because there are there are so many moon based stories in Doctor Who, right? Going back to the moon base. <laughs> yeah, it's like you name checked it inadvertently, but you did. <laughs> uh, and, you know, what are, so, so like all of those yeah. other moon base stories were basically taking place on, on top of a giant egg. And egg. consciously so, in some of you think about it, because from Frontier in Space, I believe the doctor is taken prisoner. There's a prison on the moon. Right. Um, so they've, you know, even after you know it's an egg we're still like building cities there and yeah and doing facility like why why would you do that you know like if it's an yeah. egg i mean maybe we shouldn't be doing that i don't know like i i mean maybe they uh, there's there's a survey and some decision made in that regard but uh, since this one took a hundred million years apparently to hatch uh yeah we'll, we'll be fine um fair enough but it is like one of those things like how do you reconcile it with it never coming up i i don't hate the doctor's explanation i actually kind of don't mind that the episode essentially gives itself license to do it you know because he Mm -hmm. says like well maybe it's a projection in the future even though he knows it's not if he if he has any memory uh Mm -hmm. or it's it's a different moon which is probably like okay that that can work so so i i don't mind it's like well we can still have stakes even though we have a universe right so so that's okay um but again when they resolve it this in the way that they resolve it it is, uh, it brings, you know, again, brings up a host of questions and, uh, things you don't even want to, 
think about. I mean, honestly, yeah. you, you, you're you questioning it, but you're also like, you know what? I'm just going to erase this one from my Doctor Who memory. <laughs> like, I don't want to reconcile it with other things because it just doesn't work. Yeah, well, Doc, Doctor Who is, is is like a constant battle of like trying trying to overcome your own, uh, you know, disbelief, right? You know, willing yeah. suspension of disbelief can sometimes be a problem with Doctor Who. Definitely a problem in this episode. But uh, let's let's go for let's say you're not being yes and you've decided to give us an entire new history for the moon. Fine, okay. fair enough. Even then, even being consistent within the rules of the episode itself. Yeah. How do we get a new egg? I know. At the end of it, it's not even visible in the first part of the CGI where you see the creature, you see yeah. the, the the moon shell being destroyed. The creature flies away. There's nothing there left. There's in that particular scene, uh, but then all of a sudden, there's a new egg. Is uh, uh, the- somehow it's in orbit, and somehow yeah. it's exactly the same size, and somehow like it, it that that honestly like. Uh, you, you, all, everything up to that point was not okay, yeah. but that was just like, oh come on, you yeah. know, like it was literally like, oh, the, like why not make the bolder choice? And it, there just isn't one. Yeah, and and maybe some sequel episode replaces the moon that someone else writes. Like just, just well, there's no moon now, and there's no tides, and we'll live with it, you know. And or maybe like I'm just just brainstorming it right here. <laughs> let's let's totally headcanon this stuff. Maybe. Earth gets together and builds a new moon. There you go. Right? Maybe that would be a way for us to to get into space and and to encourage everyone to get really back into the space race. Maybe we collect all of the shards of the discarded egg and we stick it back together. Um, and that's how we develop our, you know, our spacefaring skills uh, is by doing that. And maybe you can insert some sort of lunar habitats on the inside as you're doing it. You know? Um, there we go. You get and you get good yeah. at like uh, sculpting it over the mm-hmm. years so that it actually looks like the old moon, right? With this yeah. you know, tranquility back and whatever, because we have all the, it's all mapped uh, in a precise that, way. You could do that. That would definitely be in line with like what, what, why we're going, why NASA wants to go back to the moon is sort of as a way station for Mars and, uh, and a learning process for Mars, right? So it makes sense that it, it is our next, uh, it's our hopping off point. We haven't fully developed it so you know let's speak yeah. to that if you want to, if your goal is to get us exploring space um you know then 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 at least do something like that that feels right feels somewhat sciencey enough yeah um and I do, I do i do want to interject and say look i wrote a book on star wars i get you know star the whole point of star wars was as george lucas said in 77 i just wanted to have fun and ignore science that's why there's sound in space i right. get it I get it. Star Wars is a world where some, you know, universe where spaceships can just drive around like cars and do three point turns and, and all of that. Like it doesn't make physics sense, but it doesn't stop you. Like it feels mm, right. real enough when you're watching it. It feels truthy enough yeah, to, sure. uh, to use the Stephen Colbert phrase. Um, and that's fine. I'm fine with that. Just don't keep hitting me over the head with an iron skillet every time that you try and do these things, right? You know, just it. That's the th- that's the grating thing is that I cannot get over any of these things the way that it has been written. Well, and also like uh, as you were speaking there about the um, how Star Wars and uh, you know the the science getting in the way. I feel like they there's a few ways that they didn't have to do it, not just with the physics we're talking about in the the portrayal of the egg, but like they they actually say at one point it's a hundred million years old. Yeah. I think, which is not at all true for the moon. If any, you know, it's like billions of years old. Yeah. But here's the other thing. Here's what I think this was. And they should have been more explicit about it if this was what it was, which is that the in the in the Doctor Who universe. The moon is what caused the Silurians to mm. go underground yes. and put themselves in hibernation. So in the Doctor Who universe, again, this is probably before um, science had either truly determined what the age of the moon was or just wasn't well known that uh, Doctor Who thought it could do that. Also, it was a different show. They were just like, whatever. Well, we're going to fast and loose with this stuff. Mm. Mm-hmm. We're not going to do research. Fair enough. So <laughs> if this if in the doctor who universe is a hundred million years and you want to keep that because it, it 
stays consistent with the picture of the Silurian spine, say that. Yes. You have a reference to the Silurian so that's what we know what you're doing and you're not just making a mistake. Uh, yeah. Because without that reference, it just sounds like they don't know what they're talking about. It's just I like mean, inaccurate. Or And if you're not going to do it, you don't have to give a number. Like yeah. literally just say it's millions of years old and leave it at that. Like don't be specific when you don't have to be. I'm, I'm going to say something that is not going to be said very often in this podcast, but Chibnall did it better. Uh, and we, <laughs> and we, we saw this with dinosaurs on a spaceship, right? And he did it better in that because there was at least a mention of the moon. So if you're a Silurian fan, you know that this Silurian ship, you know, is, is heading for Earth. And like there's, there's a, the moon is briefly name checked. And right. if you're, a, you know, if you're a long term fan, you know why they're name checking it, right? So there's something has been thrown in. So Chibnall did it better than Moffat here. Uh, or, you know, Moffat very much being with his hand on the tiller on this one. Mm. And, uh, you know, just perhaps not really thinking it through uh, and, you know, going going a little bit too far. And, yeah. Uh, too far. <laughs> yeah. But I want to get back to sort of praising some of the things about this episode that yes. worked. So we talked about Hermione Norris and her character mm-hmm. uh, Lundvik, I guess, is her name. Yes. And I think she's great. Like, she, like, the the acting job is excellent. Like she's obviously this very humorless, cynical character. Mm. Uh, She's a product of the world she comes from, which, you know, as I said, was maybe not dystopian, but clearly a world that's not doing that well. Mm -hmm. And she's there to give that sort of perspective to personify that wounded world. And it's forgotten how to be inspired and optimistic. And I think that's great. And I think I get, that's the whole theme. Um, But I think the, the the structure of this episode, it's really unfortunate that they decide to have a Capaldi speech at the end be mm. sort of the end of that arc because you want something from her. You want yeah. to feel like she had more agency here or at the very least personifies the very sort of inspiration that the doctor talks about. Because otherwise it's, it's really just talked about. It's really just yeah. mentioned. You don't, you don't get any sense of... Uh, from from anyone other than him that this really is such a great moment you just see this thing like you know you you just like to see her say something or have some part of her character or her backstory suddenly come alive and almost in a way that we 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 get get full on with Lindsay yeah. Duncan in the waters of mars and about exactly. how she was spared by the dalek like you really feel it mm. in that case like you mm. get this character's arc and the emotional journey they're on here it's just talked about and it's just it's too bad, and it's a sign of the carelessness of the, which with which Lundvik's character is treated. That she's left on that beach at the end, uh, and mm-hmm. the Doctor's like, "Oh, NASA's that way," you know, several thousand miles. Like, <laughs> why, why not just? I get that the you know the TARDIS is not a you know a shuttle service, unless you're a policeman in 1920s England, then it is, um, <laughs> as we found out in Black Orchid, but. Um, like just just dump her on the beach like that it's, yeah that just, uh, you know uh, because you then want to focus on the doctor and clara and and courtney let's let's talk about courtney like you I, know, I, okay. will say, I will just throw out a connection of yeah. sole survivors of space disasters that end up on a beach she yes. and sandra bullock have a lot to talk about <laughs> Yeah, and and uh, wow, yes, what a what a waters of Mars connection there, right? She she oh, doesn't yeah. shoot herself when she returns <laughs> to Earth when she should have died on the moon. Like, why don't we see any changing newspapers there? I've just realized that. Holy shit, another oh, reason. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. language, language. Um <laughs> which is always supposed often to happen used. this way. Well, it's not always. a fixed point in time, Chris. <laughs> oh god, it's a it's a gray point in time, maybe. Um Okay, I, I, we shouldn't harp on the science too much. Uh, yes. If you do want to harp on the science, I want to give a shout out to Phil Plate, who is Bad Astronomer on Twitter, at Bad Astronomer, uh, writes for Slate. He did an excellent story about this in which he gets through goes through all of the science issues. Moon is 4.5 billion years old. I mean, he, he also suggests ways to headcanon it, say that you know the cycle repeats every 100 million years. Like the, the today's moon is the forty fifth mm. moon, you know. There, there's oh. an idea. Oh, yeah. And of course, he also points out like eggs don't change weight. We know this. <laughs> like, <laughs> do, do do your do your chickens suddenly get like sucked in towards the egg when they've laid it? If they if there's an embryo inside it, no. Yeah. Um, 
uh, the moon's mass is 50 billion times 1.3 billion tons. It's 50 billion times the mass of the creature. It's not going to make a noticeable effect uh, on the earth. It's not going to change the, uh, you know, the, uh, the tidal system at all. Barely. Maybe you get an earlier King tide or something. I, I don't know, but like, it's just not going to work. Uh, and the, 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 a cube of, he makes the point that a cube of air, uh, six miles outside would have a mass of a billion tons. Uh, but if the, the creature is as big as it's supposed to be, it would be more than 1.3 billion tons. Uh, where does all the rest of the moon go? Um, right. yeah. Anyway. Uh, and, and also, and I'll add to that, like, why call spiders bacteria? They are spiders. Just call them spiders. Say no. that they're acting like bacteria or something. Like, again, that was a giant iron skillet to the face that I couldn't oh ignore. Oh, my God. That one where he says it's unicellular. That, that yeah. stopped me in my tracks because I'm like, wait a minute. It has teeth. It has eyes. Mm-hmm. It has knees. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> You, there's no way this is a single cell that doesn't that doesn't make any goddamn sense i'm sorry yeah. i'm swearing too much here on our podcast language <laughs> language i love that this is an episode where people are constantly remonstrated against for using bloody uh in in their language and uh you know of course that that has a lovely payoff in the end when when clary uses it um but uh, but yeah, it, you definitely kind of need to use some language when talking about kill the moon. But let me talk. About, let, so, okay, so let's let's leave the science aside. We're done. Yeah. We've complained. It's done. Let me <laughs> throw in another issue, which is it uh, takes us back to um, uh, sound of drums. Okay, which is this may be the worst U.S. politics mistake in Doctor Who since President Elect Winters, if you right. remember that yes. in Sound of the Drums. The, RTD makes that that one misstep in an otherwise Viscount banger of an episode uh, in which he has the president-elect basically coming along and speaking for all of Earth, when, of course, we know president-elect is just the president in waiting. Now, here's another potential mistake. When the, the doctor casually mentions at the end that Courtney becomes the president of the United States. And, and you know, it was so casual. I, I missed it the first couple of times. Yeah. I, I honestly did. I, I didn't. I, only when I was reading and researching it that I re- I saw it mentioned, and I was like, "Wait a minute! Did he say that?" He he says it so quickly at the end, mm. and because and, and and I was way more caught up in Clara's emotional state right then to really the even thing. process it. That's you know? the thing. If you have to believe that Clara is to, it is going to want to tell him to shut up at that point, after he's just said that his pupil somehow extremely improbably becomes president of the United States. Now I get that that is sort of a callback to an earlier part of the script where they say, you know, who should make this decision for earth, the president. Well, she, they say it's a she nice touch, um, has got too much on her plate, right? Like, you know, take this decision off her plate. First of all, why? No, that (laughs) maybe, (laughs) no, maybe the world leader should be involved in this. Um, but, but yeah, so for Courtney to become president of the United States, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it would require a constitutional amendment, right? Because well, she is not, uh, so far as we know. Yeah, she, she, it's possible she's, she was she's born an American in the States. citizen. It's, yeah, it so is she's possible. A citizen. Uh, it's possible. We just don't it's, know her background. You would just have to have that. Like, like why does a girl speaking with an English accent have uh, a future in which she becomes president of the United States? You have to give us a little bit more than that. And if you're Clara in that moment, you're like, I'm not listening. Shut up, doctor. I'm not listening to you. Wait a minute. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, you'd be like, what? Huh? Hang on. Just explain that bit. Then I'll get mad at you. Yeah. I got <laughs> So I want to ask. Why not this? just make her prime minister? So there's another decision around Courtney that I wanted to get your take on because I mm-hmm. honestly don't know how I feel about it. It's yeah. and it's her decision to go back to the TARDIS that she's mm-hmm. scared and she wants to go back, which uh, I'm split on it because it sounds it is. It is a realistic depiction I think of what a child would feel like. Yeah. And or a lot of people would feel like not even just a child. Like I, I didn't sign up for this. There's a safe haven, a time ship over here that looks pretty safe. I'm just going to go in there. Hmm. Like you guys figure out this moon business. And I, I think that's fine, but I'm a kind of with Lundvik later where she says, you left, you don't have a say now. Like, yeah. and yeah, <laughs> you know, like you chickened out of this adventure uh, again, maybe I'm sure you know you didn't really sign up for it, so I get it. But I'm also like, 
and I, I, I'm not sure if I want you to do anything anymore. And I'm not sure yeah. I'm really that behind you becoming president later either. So. Yeah, Courtney is kind of hard to like in this episode, I think. Like, first yeah. of all, the whole premise starts with her really wanting to know that she's special. Now, okay, yes, I get it. We should tell kids that they're special. Uh, but also, like, uh, unless... Uh, I mean, she she's in deep breath. She's in the caretaker. Had, right. Has she done anything to really endear us to her at this point? Mm, no, not really. She, she she has her one line about um, this is not at this point. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the final sanction bit. That's honestly the thing I remember most about her portrayal which is that oh no that was deep breath no no yeah so like mm. deep breath is when the, the clockwork robots mm -hmm. threaten clara to, to kill her and then she's like go on then and she recalls when courtney right. did the same thing to her as a teacher she's like she's i'm gonna you know, expel yeah. you both mm -hmm. i'm gonna expel everyone it's like go ahead you know and it's like oh mm. <laughs> like you call you call my bluff you know yeah. like so but that's yeah. not the same as making her a character that, that we care about. So we're kind sure. of with the doctor Great. here. Like, you know, why, why do you need a specialness trophy? Um, you know, what, what is it, you know? And, and also, yeah, the doctor should have just said it, but yeah, I, I get that he would then kind of take that as a cue to, Oh, I'm going to make you special. That maybe is of a piece with his egomania. Yeah. Yeah. But then like get to go from that to non-involvement is a bit weird. Um, but then to, to have her go back, I, I was also stopped by the way uh, with her, you know, uh, that's one thing for a thingy, that's one thingy for a thingy, one small thingy for a thingy, one big thingy for a thingy thingy. Uh, and okay, yeah, I get that that might be what a kid says. Also, it's just kind of like, eh, doesn't really endear Courtney to us. I yeah. did like that she was posting on Tumblr. That was Tumblr. fun. Yeah, it takes me back. <laughs> that was, I guess, right around Yahoo was acquiring it around that time. Maybe I just yes. Yeah, it was before Tumblr really died um, yeah. <laughs> after its Yahoo acquisition. Um, oh, by the way, like, this is funny. Like, she's posting to Tumblr from 2049. Exactly. Which is yes. a weird. Is she posting in 2049 or is there a little time shifting going on here? It's really unclear. I think you have to say that there's time shifting. Yeah, I think right? you do. Uh, and, and that does bring up an issue with the whole space phone thing that we have successfully <laughs> ignored in episodes like Dinosaurs in a Spaceship, uh, right? You know, that the, that the phones work as across time. And that's one thing that is sort of maybe tickling you at the back of your brain when you watch those episodes is like, is how does that work exactly? Yeah. And can you not call people in the past and get them to change the future? Like, how would you use and abuse that? Um, yeah, so true. posting on Tumblr does make the mistake, I think, a mistake of like going further into that problem. Um, yeah. And again, making it, giving us just another piece of disbelief that we have to suspend. You know, yeah. our brains are working overtime in this episode already with the suspension of disbelief. And you are throwing one extra thing in there. Um, but in to, to your point of like her going back to the TARDIS, I, I kind of like that bit. I, I, I liked it because of the whole thing of like, have you got any games in there? You know, <laughs> which it sort of <laughs> seems to be what, what, a, what a teen or, or tween or however old she's supposed to be would say. Um, like I yeah. get it. That's sort of a, like every parent's had that situation. Your kid wants to go back to the car, and, uh, or you know, you're leaving them at home, and you're like, hey, "Don't play any, you know, don't touch this, don't play any games, don't, you know, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Um, I get so it. Like, like that's, you know, as a parent, mm. I tend to say, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> home doesn't exist, yeah. and you know get to get it together like we're, yeah. we're doing this other thing now that said it's usually not life-threatening whatever it does bring yeah. in the other suspension of disbelief thing which you have to suspend disbelief throughout the entire history of doctor who that they wouldn't just go back to the tardis in yeah. every story and this is something that i've brought up time and again it's why yeah. i like i like tardis heavy episodes because they do actually think of returning to it it is it does bring up that that moment in um the uh, the impossible pit, I think it is the the Satan uh, pit. Or the, the Satan pit sorry, um, 
the uh, you know where where they have that the doctor and Rose have this burst out laughing at the beginning because they're like yeah. oh we we could just go back to the TARDIS <laughs> that was too much breaking of the fourth wall for me I always I really, yeah really no I, I think out. it was not super well done I think mm-hmm. that, I, I actually kind of like the idea though because I I've said mm-hmm. this before I think we're a little bit on opposite sides of this fence where they don't do that and to me mm-hmm. I I think this works even though what it works in doing is make me not like Courtney because yeah. I see the going back to the Stardust or the lack of desire to do that as TARDIS team material. You know, mm-hmm. if you want to keep going back to the TARDIS into safety, then we're just going to bring you home. Right. And, mm-hmm. and in the middle of this adventure, they can't do it physically. So I, I get it. Um, even though there's no real reason they couldn't, but you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. a story. Um, so, I, I'm again. I'm I'm fine with that happening in the story as a realistic portrayal. I just think it doesn't service that character very well, and it just sort of ends up being um, kind of extraneous. This extraneous loop that that character does that doesn't really do much for overall what they're trying to do. Uh, one other thing that is extraneous and doesn't really do much, <laughs> I will add, there is this straight like I don't even know why they did it uh, other than to fill time or or make it a little more action heavy there's a bit toward the end of the episode where they slow motion run through an exploding corridor that Mm -hmm. was just out of nowhere like i i I did not get that at all like i like i guess the moon's sort of coming apart but like why is it causing things to explode and why do they i i I even forget the story reason they're going from one place to another in this mexican base it's just literally to do the doctor who cliche it seems like yeah. we have to have a corridor and we have to have an explosion, mm-hmm. but by doing it for no reason, it, it sort of draws attention to the cliche and that it's a cliche, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it's, it's just a really bad choice in my opinion. It does. And maybe I saw this more watching it in five minute increments. So I didn't get too mad. Uh, it, it does have that feel of a show that is supposed to be watched in five minute increments and does sort of change its mind every so often. Like the, at the, at one point the doctor says, no, nobody dies. Um, no, as, as if, died. yeah, exactly. <laughs> he a says, liar. No, no, or maybe it's like, nobody has to die. Like okay. uh, maybe at least throw in a line of like, there have already been people who died, yeah. you know, including this poor Mexican mission that nobody seems to care about. Um, almost, almost added some language there. Um, yeah, <laughs> like those two astronauts. Who, you know, they're not really fleshed out, but you know, she does say something like about he was a grandfather or something mm-hmm. like that, and he's just eaten by the spiders. And for some yeah. reason, the spider doesn't do anything to the doctor even when it jumps out, even though it seemed to kill those other guys pretty quickly. Um, so how, how are these spiders yeah. carnivores as well? Like if they're bacteria they just like they they feast on the the egg juice or something yeah and then i guess and, i mean I, and just to sort they of also like the taste of humans every so often as well, a just a part of like again if we're inventory in the pylon like you mentioned star wars and sound in space yeah. there there's sound in space here when the spider attacks <laughs> the guy and they can the footsteps and there's they're screaming this is the surface of the moon there should be no sound like yeah but did they did not just create more mass but more atmosphere <laughs> yeah more, i guess and then there's the whole thing where, where courtney like loses um weight uh you know uh, and and shoots up oh, in the room right. for some reason which makes no no sciencey sense so, so apparently in the well the script has the line from the doctor that says because it's essentially shifting weight the creature's moving mm. a little bit that that screws up the gravity but it that seems very strange it would be so localized like with literally like they can run but she can't and that's only a few feet difference that doesn't make any sense um there is a something in the commentary where they say oh her boots don't really work and that or like in her spacesuit so the other ones have sort of gravity boots and that's the reason but it's actually never said Mm-hmm. I, I I've tried to rewind and find that bit of dialogue. I looked at a transcript. There's nothing in there about it unless I've missed it. And someone go ahead and write in and tell me, but th- I think he might be thinking of the original script versus the shooting script or, 
you know, there, there might have been a line that was just cut at some point, but without the cut line, it's just they, they had her float because they needed to for the story. And there's no real yeah. reason for it. And no yeah. one bothered to fix it, which is tells do, you the utter carelessness they're doing here. Yeah. Speaking of the careless, like, we don't want to lay the, all of this at Peter Harness's door. Uh, right. It is also Moffat. Moffat is supposed sure. to be at the wheel here. Now, we do know about this season of Doctor Who that Moffat didn't necessarily want to do it. Right, he was kind of done with Day of the Doctor, you know, the, the end of the Matt Smith era, but there was no one else who could step in. Yeah. He had to keep doing it with Capaldi. He did kind of get a burst of new energy with Capaldi, but you also get the sense that he's a little bit manic. Like I was literally just when I was reading the Doctor Who magazine preview of Day of the Doctor, he, um, you know, there's this. Uh, he has a column in that same issue, in which he seems a little bit more mad than usual, in which he seems a little bit more sort of I'm prepared to break all of Doctor Who canon than usual. <laughs> and, uh, you know, somebody stop me. Kind of, you know, he, he come up, comes up <laughs> with these no ridiculous notions. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, he is he's become showrunner victorious um, here. <laughs> and he just, he's gone too far. He's gone too far, and it's definitely on show here. And a, a different showrunner, I think, would have would have caught a lot more of these problems. Like, yeah. there is a way, I'm not saying don't do Kill the Moon. Yeah. I'm not saying don't do the moon as a giant egg. I'm saying like there are different ways to do that. You could have like that would cause enough problems for Earth without you having to talk about the tides. Hmm. Uh, right? You know, you just you could spend all that time talking about how you reconcile this notion with with everything we've seen in Doctor Who so far. At least just a line or two. You know, that's yeah. the new who way. Well, and that's also what, what what I thought I felt like Davies was really, really good at mm-hmm. in terms of mm-hmm. like a single line throw away that, you know, it, it might be a, technically a hand wave, but at least mm-hmm. we kind of like nod along. OK, yeah, I've, I've gotten enough so that I, I'm filing this in my yeah. why this is happening. And now go ahead and do your thing. And curiously, there, there is there's that line where the doctor talks. He he uh, goes through some techno babble of all the ways in which a a, a thing could gain weight or could gain mass. Yeah. Um, he talks about gravity bombs or something like it, it. Just he has a whole list of kind of you know sciencey sounding techno babble, and that works. It yeah. works. We're just like okay, that's something I don't understand. It makes sense that the doctor does have all of these explanations so why not use one of those like, like yeah. why not <laughs> explain it th- that way like if you're going to introduce those um you know or do something along those lines like just don't or explain the new egg somehow at the very least yeah. so we're not left with that bad taste in our mouth at the end ah oh yes i wouldn't have minded <laughs> if even like it was the doctor that did it you know, mm. like the creature hatches, but somehow the doctor uses some Gallifreyan technology to to duplicate the moon. Yeah, you know, it's like I, I, I you, you know, maybe you, that's how he's gone too far, and maybe how that's what causes yeah. Clara to have the break with him. But yeah, yeah, if it's going to be the super crux point in the Doctor and Clara's relationship, make it something we can believe. Right. You know? Yeah. But as as a crux point in their relationship, um, it's funny. I, I you remember in Hell Bent mm-hmm. when we did that commentary, I inventoried the number of times the Doctor and Clara say goodbye. Yeah, and there are roughly seven. And I forgot about this one. Like this is <laughs> this is kind of a goodbye, uh, yeah. which is it's kind of forgettable. I think partly because, as I recall, this is isn't even really dealt with much in the next episode mummy on the orient express um they, they, I think they, they do they, say that it's their last hurrah clara says it's their last hurrah right and there's something like yeah. that which is a little bit yeah i mean anyway we'll get to that when we get to it but i, I get that though like i actually like that bit um and i will say that this is you know we, we talked about before on the show about the moment that i rage quit old old who which was mm. uh time in the time in the running uh, you know, as soon as we saw that Sylvester McCoy regeneration that wasn't a regeneration, I was yeah. like, I'm I'm out. That's it. I'm done. 
I almost rage quit New Who <laughs> after Kill the Moon. Like that's how bad it was for me the first time around. Uh, I right. would be glad to know I'm not rage quitting. Pull to open. Um, you know, it, it was <laughs> a little bit better. Uh, but but also like Mummy on the Orient Express did actually save New Who for me. Like I I I, I did keep watch. So I, I was so fully prepared to accept that and it does actually point out what one of the best parts of kill the moon is for it to my mind the scene with danny pink and clara at the end yeah no it is everything that kill the moon is not it is it is believable um you know it's sort of and he has that wise line she even does say how did you get to be so wise and he said like everyone else i had a bad day love that line that is some wisdom in itself you have to have a bad day to be wise but also he says like you can't actually properly break up with him until you can say this and not be mad yeah no at the same time incredible piece of writing love that um i think the first time around i watched it i was too full of rage to kind of even notice that scene yeah it 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 deserves to be it's it's good so good it deserves to be in a different episode yeah, uh, yeah, because I forgot about it too entirely. Everyone remembers Kill the Moon for all the things we've been raging about, like the ridiculousness mm. of the science, those dumb spiders, um, the Clara Doctor stuff, which kind of works and kind of doesn't. Um, and that's kind of where I was going with that sort of final scene. And I, I'm using that as a bit of a, uh, as a oh, sorry, what I use as a bit of a measure on that the the Doctor Clara argument is my kids' reaction to it because. Mm. Uh, particularly Grace, who's a little younger, but she was just perplexed. Like, wh- why is she mad? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, he's just being the doctor and whatever. And like, the, it was just a little like it felt incongruous with what we had just seen. And I think it just again, like it's it's unclear. They don't come out and say he was lying. You yeah. Know? So because well, of that, of, it's, it's yeah, the morality of it's unclear. Mm. Um, it- it is part of a season long. I may, maybe this is another reason why the randomizers took us here after Orphan Fifty Five because we were complaining about Orphan Fifty Five that it was like it's a season long arc of of the Doctor being upset about Gallifrey's destruction at the hands right. of the Master, but we don't we don't get reminded of that. Right? right. There's no she she's just a bit moody. Yeah. In every episode, she's just a little sad earlier, which is the, that's the, a hint of a. It's not referring to it. It's a hint of a reference, but it's not really a reference. Right. Right. So yeah. we were uh, when we were at that, we were like, no, you need to hit us over the head a little bit more with what the season arc is. And I would say the same the same here. The season arc is that Clara doesn't like the new doctor. Yeah. And the new doctor is kind of an asshole. Right? Yeah. Especially to Danny Pink. Um that that is the arc. So that that sort of makes sense here. But again, kind of maybe maybe we should hint at that. Like, you know, she is as Madame Vastra I correctly identified in Deep Breath, she was flirty flirty with the Doctor. There was hints of a potential relationship there. Yeah. And now obviously with the Capaldi Doctor, it's obviously not happening. It's gone in the opposite direction. Now let's see, let's hear and see a little bit more about that, if that is going to be the overall arc. Let's have yeah. other reasons. Like I, I Clara in that moment, I think that she sort of reached the end of her tether with Peter Capaldi not being Matt Smith. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it feels right. like to me. So say that. Yeah. You yeah. know, and maybe, maybe the, you know, and, and she is sort of saying that in the sense of like, I'll slap you so hard you regenerate. Like maybe if she'd just thrown in and again, like, I really hate this regeneration. I'm going to slap you so hard you'll regenerate and maybe I'll like the next one. You know? That would have been good. That would have yeah. been more helpful because it is trying to go out of its own episode and do mm. do this arc thing and it doesn't mm. quite land certainly not in the mm. way we do it um mm. but you mentioned grace's reaction let's talk about um i'm curious about how how your kids viewed this in general um the whole story. yeah well jack thought he used the word mid a couple times <laughs> he said the overall story was slightly above average but he said right. it's like basically mid the spiders are mid, mid. um that's such a great gen z rating yeah, and he thought I, I think he thought the doctor was good in this one. And mm-hmm. I think that's a bit of a testament to Capaldi and how he kind of grows on you, um, at least as a viewer, if not not for Clara. Um, Grace thought the Courtney spraying the spider was really good. And I think that's, you know, for obviously they're close in age and it's good to see sort of a kid thinking on their feet 
and killing the monster. I think that's a really nice moment for kids. Uh, mm. But she didn't love it, you know? And she was the one that was more confused by that final scene. Like, why is she mad? You know, like she's just mm. on this adventure with the doctor and the doctor did doctory stuff. And then we're at the end and I don't know why she's yelling at him. So, yeah. Um, again, she may really be more mad at herself for you know dis- <laughs> disrespecting Earth democracy. Yeah, 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 maybe. <laughs> um, but that's a question we can ponder as Ooh. we Ooh. ponder some other questions, which of Here course the segue are the four questions to Doomsday. The four questions to segue. Yes. Okay. First question. Why did the randomizer take us here? Ooh, well, we've tackled a bit of this. I think that, uh, you know, the, the Lanzarote, we haven't mentioned this, the, la- the fact that the moon sequences were filmed in Lanzarote mm. did leave some fans at the time to think that they were going back to San, the <laughs> planet from Planet of Fire. And uh, Planet of Fire was the randomizer's very first pick That's on Call to Open, if you remember. So it may have been, uh, you know, we I believe we have a Lanzarote bingo. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> we have a uh, potential mention of San bingo, um, you know, and, yeah. and we do have a Peter Harness bingo. So the, the randomizer wanted to get the, all of those out of the way. It did want to... You mess with us, I think, after Orphan 55 and say, oh, you thought Chibnall did it bad? Did the the bad sciencey stuff? Well, take a look at this. (laughs) See how the Moffat era did it worse. So I got to say, the Lanzarote stuff looks great, by the way. Like, in terms of choosing it, like, like, this is a really good, uh, the moon looks great. Like, this is like, okay, if you're going to do the moon, go on location in Lanzarote and use it for the moon because it's, it's very convincing. Um, that is not a set and very, very, very uh, nice looking episode. Mm. My thought on the connection to Orphan 55 is that it's flipping the possible future resolution that they have in Orphan 55 that, oh, blah, 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 global warming, the earth becoming a wasteland populated by dregs is only one possible future. Make mm. better choices, humanity. I said at the time, that is not how Doctor Who treats the future. And yeah. here is, is kind of a better way to do what they wanted to do within mm-hmm. the Doctor Who structure. So The gray the area. Yeah, it does the gray area explanation, but it also actually explicitly says the line, the future is no more malleable than the past. Mm. And that is how Doctor Who should be looking at at the universe. And mm-hmm. again, it doesn't mean the Doctor knows everything that's going to happen. Here it's questionable. Um, but that, that's how to properly do it. So that, that was my tie in. And we already talked about the waters of Mars tie in, which was not too long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but in both of them, you have this 21st century day after tomorrow future with, uh, super high stakes. And right. I think in the waters of Mars, those stakes are earned and it handles them really well here. <laughs> less so <laughs> here, here. Lots of things feel tacked on, you know, you yes. need, like particularly where the doctor, the doctor's speech at the end, this is where everything happens. Everything starts. You could have still had the story without that much attached to it. It's similar to when we did um, oxygen hmm. where they had to tack on. This is the end of capitalism for the entire universe for some reason. And, <laughs> and like as if speaking those stakes, somehow make it more impactful. It doesn't. It actually sort of has the opposite effect because now you're just talking about a thing you're not feeling and you're not earning it. And very similar here. So it's mm. a, it's an instructive um, episode for those reasons. Very, very instructive. And I like the Waters of Mars tie-in. I hadn't thought about that watching it, but yeah, you are absolutely right. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm not got much more than that, except that the randomizer really wanted to test us and i almost want to shout at the (laughs) randomizer the way that clara shouts at the doctor like forget i'm gonna walk away from you randomizer i'm like done with this but i would just be doing it in anger and i wouldn't like if i can tell the randomizer that i'm going to quit it in you know 
<laughs> in calm, measured tones, um, then then we'll know that it's truly over. But it's yeah, it's clearly not over between the randomizer and me, even though it felt like it did this just to get at us. <laughs> well, what else is this? over for this one well that's not the second question no the second question is what if the evil plot had succeeded okay so you got to say the evil plot is earth's evil plot to destroy the creature inside the moon i guess the only evil but, plot i can see i mean what else is there? other than the doctors maybe the problem with that being the evil plot is like we know nothing about this creature yeah we're just you know, uh, some people at the time saw this as a potential um, way to talk about the abortion debate, which I don't yeah. want to get into. Like, that could be a whole podcast on its own. Let's not go there. But, you know, let's say that it does bring up this issue of, like, you know, is is Earth trying, does Earth want to abort, quote unquote, this creature? When you don't know, like, the, there's potential for this creature to kill everyone and everything, I guess. Like uh, maybe they should have introduced a little bit more uh, risk element with that because it's not entirely clear how it would do that. And uh, like, is it just that it looks evil? I don't know. Uh, is and is it truly a baby if it's a hundred million years old? Like I know I know Baby Yoda is fifty years old, but this is ridiculous. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, so if it had succeeded, then. The, the evil plot, and, and, and Clara does go for the democracy, or what she thinks is a democracy, and she does allow the button to be hit and the moon to be blown up, then I guess Clara dies along with, uh, uh, with uh, Lundvig up there on, on the moon? Uh, I and guess. Pauline? Well, I mean, so, I, the doctor is going to come back at the last second and save everyone, surely, right? I mean, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but... Okay, so <laughs> the abortion thing, I, yeah, I've, I've heard that talked about too. Mm. I don't see it. I think you really have to stretch to turn it into that because then who's mm. the mother? I guess Earth is the mother because it's technically our womb. And then, so then do we have the right to do it? I guess we do then. But then they seem to take the opposite tack and mm. the end there. So if, oh, if it is trying to be egg, some kind of pro choice thing, yeah. then mm. it's sort of inadvertently coming out on the pro life side. So yeah. I, I don't. Well, I mean, I'm not judging either side. I mean, that's a perfectly valid side to take. It's just like I, I think it is not that. <laughs> I, I, I'd yeah. rather just this is a sci-fi situation with incredibly high stakes that has nothing to do with that. Uh, and I prefer to leave it at that. So, in this case, yes, if the evil plot succeeds, they kill the creature, do, do, and they seem to imply the moon blows up. That this is literally enough megatonnage in these explosives that the moon itself mm. would just be utterly you know fragmentized to borrow a, a word from the cyber leader uh, would it I, I okay if we assume that's true um do, does that create a, a a problem like if the moon's no more and it's just this mass of rocks and i guess a corpse yeah does that does uh, the corpse blow up too yeah, do you yeah, still have tides? Do you still have the same mass? I guess it's a larger mass still, right? So you still have crazy high tides that are drowning the Earth, so you still have the same problem, do you not? Uh, yeah, or you get it to a seven eaves. And here's another reason why the randomizer brought us here, by the way. I did mention seven eaves, the Neil Stevenson novel recently, uh, mm -hmm. which does open with the moon being uh, carved into seven pieces, and then, and then slowly those pieces hit each other and it disintegrates into this massive thing that, that cover, basically kills the earth. Uh, cause it just creates fire in the atmosphere. And that one is actually hundred percent hard science, true physics uh, in wow. the style of Neil, Neil yeah. Stevenson, um, that it, that it would do that. So thanks. Thanks randomizer for taking us to the most relevant story to seven Eves. I promise <laughs> I'll never mention it again. That's why Jesus. the randomizer took us here. Yeah. <laughs> Got a hankering for those, just, uh, yeah. Yeah, I just realized that. Whoa. Um, yeah, so it does. It could still destroy the Earth, maybe. I mean, or maybe there's just a corpse of a dragon creature in the sky. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to evaluate because it's so fast and loose with its own science. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. science and its own science. So you're kind of like, well, what would even happen? I have no freaking idea. All I mm -hmm. can hope is that, and then this is what the Earth is hoping, it kills the creature. We just have the same moon we've always had. And we can just go about our business. 
which I kind of want that evil plot to succeed because <laughs> I'd like to forget about that the kill the moon ever happened. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of going with it. Is it really that evil? Um, I'm prepared to overlook it. And it would also like spur space exploration as well because they'd go, they'd want to go clear up that corpse. Yeah, you know, Check it or, out. or uh, create a new race of robot space crows that go, <laughs> you know, the carrion creatures that just come along and eat that uh, that dragon baby corpse while we all kind of avert our eyes for a few years. Yeah, you know, I maybe this would be a, yeah. maybe this would be a good time to kind of do what we we might have to do with climate change and like you know seed the skies like you know with uh, particles geoengineering that would turn the skies white but also reduce the temperature on earth like that is something that's being seriously discussed among climatologists a potential solution to the climate crisis maybe this would awesome. be a good time yeah like <laughs> let's go not look that. at that piece of carrion in the sky while the space crows <laughs> pick at it uh, let's just solve our problem on earth and we'll just all divert our eyes for a while all right well we can't avert our eyes from the third question <laughs> which of course is where is the clara splinter <laughs> By the way, I do. I've, I've been loving the Clara Splinter music that we've been adding uh, in the show. It's sort of lovely choir noise Thank that you. You, you probably just heard there. Thank you, Martin West of Thinking yes. Fish for our music. Thank you, ever. Thinking Fish. That, so, that, I love it. I love it. Um, Clara so I got, Oswald. It's always weird to find Clara yeah. Splinter in a Clara episode. But <laughs> exactly. as we all know, she was splintered in time at the end of The Name of the Doctor. All across the Doctor's timeline, we like to imagine she's there in every episode, which he was actually shown to be, uh, mm -hmm. even though this uh, happens after that episode, uh, going all across the Doctor's timeline. She can, of course, also project forward, so we imagine her even in episodes after the name of the Doctor, including this one. So where the hell is she? <laughs> well, I, I, I got a big one here. I, okay. I may have the biggest Clara Splinter ever. Uh, which she's, she's, which... The, she's the creature's mom. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> the previous moon. She yes, she's been putting up the previous moon. No, I I thinking that maybe this Clara Splinter was sent back to the dawn of time, to the beginning of the universe itself, wow. to change change the laws Deep of time. physics. <laughs> to oh, change wow. <laughs> the entire laws of physics uh, to allow yeah. the science in this to make sense, um, which you'd have to do. Perhaps, you know, it changed the laws of mass and weight and, and all of that. Um, uh, perhaps also she's the creature's mother. Uh, perhaps she is uh, present at the Constitutional Convention uh, in, <laughs> in 1781 or whatever that was to, to uh, you know, create new rules that would allow a British schoolgirl to become president of the United States. Right. Um, so on Doctor <laughs> Who universe, they don't have that, that restriction. They don't have that rule. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe she's in all the previous moon-based episodes, you know, warn warning people of the, the un uncertain and unusual weight changes. <laughs> all right, well, do pick one. Which one is she? <laughs> oh, I'm I'm going to go for Uber Clara, changing the laws of physics <laughs> at the very very beginning. That's uh, good. I like that. Yeah. Um, I didn't quite go that far back. Mine, I figured like Clara about twenty years prior to this. So around, you know, five years from now or so, Clara becomes this superstar city engineer. She's basically the LeBron James of city engineers. <laughs> and she she makes it super easy for every municipality, every city to just switch off their lights. Like super easy. All you have to do is this. Doesn't affect the hospitals. Doesn't affect emergency services. Mm -hmm. Doesn't affect anything that that is essential. But all the lights will go off. Okay. And so... Maybe she does this because uh, of some other adventure where it was crucial that, you know, telescopes work. OK, mm -hmm. so and you could see like a cyber fleet coming. I don't know. But she's the superstar uh, engineer that just basically uh, makes it possible for the Earth to get that signal to Clara in this episode. I'll go with that. Um, I will throw in one other possibility, which is that she's actually she actually is a contemporary Clara. Hmm. And she she comes on that that she's able to hack into that message from the moon, 
and uh she comes on after after that message being like you know what yeah do do that that's just a performative thing but but really earth uh let, let's actually just vote in an online poll um <laughs> and uh you know you're all you're all hyper connected it's the future we've all got smartphones uh just just vote now uh you know i will abide by the results of this poll to use an elon musk quote uh you know even just a twitter poll would be more more democratic um you know and since she's clara she could package the you know the message and just uh you know say all this because yeah yeah i guess she's she's a computer hacker in this in this timeline nice yeah all right well that's uh that would make her good friends with mel i think and (laughs) uh, some version of doctor history all right, folks, moving on to the last question, the final question, the only question that matters for Kill the Moon, which is, what did we think of this episode? The Polter Ropen, the Polter Ropen, the Polter Open's <laughs> rating system has five ratings. We have the Dalek, which is what we use for a good episode of Doctor Who, the Ogron, which is for a not so good episode of Doctor Who. The Professor Hater, where it's not so great an episode, but at least we learned something, or at least they tried something. The Viscount Banger, which we reserve for the best of the best. And the very rarely used Fixed Point in Time, which is a rating that is beyond ratings. The episode is beyond being rated. It is something we we cannot uh, rate because it just means so much to us for some reason. Right. Definitely not going to be that. Yeah. <laughs> Might be for um, people who were younger when they were watching this, and perhaps now now they're older, and you know maybe maybe I'd love Millie to Gibson. hear from you. <laughs> 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 yes, if you're Millie Gibson, we would definitely love to hear from you. Um, uh, whatever, uh, you definitely join us for the show, um, and we will we'll watch a story with you. But yeah, you know, I. Well, okay. Let me let me break the fourth wall of pull to open here a little bit, and say that I did just notice you changing in the Google Doc what your rating was. And yeah, I'm, I'm you, torn. Well, this is my thing. I'm back and forth. I'm as like, well. as I mm-hmm. was talking about how instructive it is in some ways, I thought it's a it's a hater, and then I thought, no, it can't. It's bad. It's a bad episode. It's an ogron. Mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. I'm in dual states. I'm like you know Amy Pond. I'm pregnant and not pregnant at the same yes. time. I think it's, this might be an Ogron hater hybrid. It like, might be. It's a it's a hater that is so worth hating on, it becomes an Ogron. Yeah, it's I mean to say it's a professor hater after and again, maybe this is why how, the way in which the randomizer is testing us is that it's saying, Oh, you've you've just put your professor hater above an Ogron, you know, because at least <laughs> we learned something. Well, how about this? You definitely learn something about what Doctor Who shouldn't be. Um, I have definitely learned true things about the moon that, um, you know, that, that the show did not contain because it spurred me to do further research. It did remind me, I, I did know this already, uh, and again, not the show's fault, but in 2017, we discovered lava tubes on the moon going deep, deep How about underground that? into a surface. Yeah, so you know what, RTD, if you're looking for... A, you know, uh, an excuse to go back to the moon, uh, this will be it. And maybe RTD can do one of his patented, you know, one one or two line things that makes Kill the Moon make sense. Um, you know, in retrospect, you know, let, let's maybe go back to the moon, see, see what's down those lava tubes, see if it is bacteria or spiders. Anyway, I, I think uh, you... Uh, I'm going to come down on the Professor Hater side of the line, but only hmm. just... Only just, and the only difference is, I think that at the beginning and the end, the the, the framing of this episode, and that that wonderful Danny Pink scene at the end. I'm going to bring it down on the Professor Hater side. That's bold. Not great. That's good. I learned a lot. I, I... I learned a lot. There was some some Professor Hater like wisdom from Danny Pink there. You know what? I I want to be contrarian and do the Ogron because uh, this was mostly a hate watch for me. Hmm. I, I think I'm going with with your logic there. Um, Mm -hmm. And also just because I am Clara at the end and I I can't, I can't just be done with this episode. You know what I mean? Like I, I, it it, it stirs emotion in me too much uh, because of what it is 
gets wrong about Doctor Who. That's an excellent point. It gets wrong various things in some ways because it's trying to be so bold and crazy Mm. bold. It falls all over itself. It crashes uh, into the surface of the moon just as the (laughs) space shuttle does, even worse. So uh, I'm doing it. I'm switching it over. I'm doing a hater on this one. I love it. Yeah, and that is an excellent, that's some Danny Pink like wisdom that you had there, Pete, just right there at the end. Just, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. If we, if we are angry at kill the moon, then we have, we are not done with kill the moon. Yeah. Like if we can, you know, tell kill the moon softly. Yeah. Sorry. We're, we're breaking up. This is it. This is the end. Then, uh, then that'll be it. But then, then it'll be an ogron. If it's just like, eh, it's bad. It's yeah. an ogron. If it's no. like, oh God, it's so bad, and here's why. Here are fifty million reasons why. Then it's a professor hater. Yeah, if you if you hear "Kill the Moon" and you're a Doctor Who fan, it's going to provoke something in you. You, mm. you definitely can't be like, "What was that again?" You'll never say that. You'll be like, oh. <laughs> "So yeah, I got to give it the hater. I got it." There it is, yeah. the double hater for "Kill the Moon," and we're going to close the book on "Kill." Is it a new Kill-like cycle? Week? Is it a new We're going moon? to kill, kill the moon. <laughs> kill and kill the moon. I like that. That's better. Yeah, which, by the way, the we didn't mention how the title came around. Peter Arnes thinks that at one point the title was Let's Kill the Moon, that he was doing it as a, <laughs> a sort of a take on Let's Kill Hitler. Which, by the way, oh my God, I'm still angry. Here's, here's my final professor hater anger at Kill the Moon, is that the doctor has to go up and bring the Hitler thing in. Mm. He says, we've been to dinner in Berlin We didn't in 1937. We didn't pop out and kill Hitler afterwards. Why not? <laughs> like that is that is definitely a th- you know it does it raises that quite like okay maybe you wouldn't maybe like this is the history thing has that you unfold as history it should, has to unfold but like everything. we already went there with let's kill Hitler and you yeah. just about managed to avoid that question by locking Hitler in a cupboard but uh, I would kill Hitler if I went back yeah. in time a lot of a lot of viewers would like don't even raise the question like uh. give us another example. You know, if you don't I, want, I have to disagree with you just because I think the show will break down under that because then you're just going back and killing mm. everything. Like, why want to kill Genghis Khan or any bad person? Yeah. Um, and I, I guess you it. can say why not, but it's also like, eh, I, I, I think you need not just for the show, but I think there is a there's a moral stance you can take that is like, look, this is mm. you you don't have the right to rewrite history entirely and then. Um, who knows yeah. if it would be even worse? Like you know, this Unintended is made time and again. I mean, you know, Flashpoint yes. in DC Comics, etc. So yeah, you do get the unintended consequences. I get that, and of course, I as as someone whose uh, grandparents met because of World War II, uh, <laughs> I would not yeah. necessarily want to wipe myself out of existence. But it's just kind of like the space phone. It's like just don't don't bring it up. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, I, I think you could you could make the point without such a hot button. Exactly. <laughs> debated in every college class uh issue okay exactly Dad all right kill, and kill the moon it was let's just kill the moon around on the floor there for a couple minutes but now <laughs> it is dead dead that we've shot it through the head right. done but what's this a new episode is growing before us oh <laughs> goodness let's, let's either run out. from it or <laughs> get into our tardis and get away from this dangerous place and uh, find out where we're going next. We're going to activate the randomizer. <laughs> yes, the randomizer composed of two elements, the codex, which we talked about in our special episode, the list of Doctor Who stories. Uh, that And uh, the codex now includes the list of stories we've done and haven't done and, and a total number. And that number is what I'm going to plug into random.org the executor or the other part of the randomizer. And uh, random.org uses atmospheric randomness including bits of the moon that may or may not have been shaken off the shell of the egg uh, to create a true random number because computers are terrible as we, we all know when we go to extremis computers are terrible at, ge- at the generating random numbers uh, so Pete what is the number of Doctor Who stories that we still have to go to we have yet to do 225 Doctor Who stories. Wow. All right. That means right. we must have been in the realm of 75 pull to open episodes, which is crazy. Uh, 77. 77. That's right. Insane. Wow. Not, 
We are really insane. getting into it. It's insane <laughs> in the egg membrane. Yeah, and typically um, here, when we're about to activate the randomizer, we have to uh, do some obligatory hand wringing and trepidation mm. over possibly getting the Daleks master plan. But as we've just <laughs> discovered in our special episode, we've uh, we should really fear flux. <laughs> fear flux. flux. Fear it. Flux is a Doctor Who. Flux is actually more minutes. Yes. Doctor Who than the Daleks Master Plan, even including Mission of the Unknown. So Flux I is am. the fixed point in time that <laughs> we uh, either want to get over with or want to avoid. Yes, I, I fear Flux. I also fear, fear her uh, every time I hit this button. Um, <laughs> I am going to give a challenge. I'm, I'm not going to give a challenge spurred by Kill the Moon. I'm going to try and bring things back to a calm level baseline. I'm not going to give the randomizer the satisfaction of having irked me into uh, a, a challenge based on Kill the Moon. I'm going to say, give us a Patrick Troughton story. Hmm. And the reason is, it's been so long. Like, I'm not counting two doctors in this. Like, a proper, which we did. That was our last technical Patrick Troughton story, right? But how long has it been since before that? I guess it was Power of the Daleks, right? Mm, which itself yeah. was not really a proper... No, we had Fury... Was that... Fury from the Deep was Fury out. Fury from the Deep, yeah. yeah we, but again, both of them lost episodes. I know a lot of Troughton is lost, but take us to a Troughton story that isn't lost. And our Troughton Droughton. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, because we, we the only Trouton episode we've done that's not lost is the Crotons. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a while back. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, Trout so Trout. I'm gonna Edit. bounce off, kill the moon, and ask the randomizer to take us something where um, there's actual good science in Doctor Ooh, Who. Yeah, yeah, good one. Uh, that might be a tough one, but it doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> it doesn't have to be 100 percent accurate. Um, but something where you you can actually learn something. So, yeah, or perhaps science that became accurate. Uh, I don't sure. know. You know, this is again changing franchises slightly. But in in uh, Star Wars, you know, a lot of astronomers complained at the the fact that Tatooine had a double sun. You know, that, that we'd never discovered that. Uh, oh wow! Uh, and we we did actually discover it in the twenty tens. We did actually find a star system with with a you know, oh, binary star right, system because we've had binary stars known about them for a while. We just didn't think they had planets. I got you. yes, yes. We found one with an exoplanet. Um, nice. So yeah, so something like that perhaps. Uh, Doctor Who uh, being ahead of the science would be very interesting. Awesome. Well, let's see what happens. Maybe we could we could combine both of those—a trout yeah, episode but... with some real science. Mm. Let's see it happen, randomizer. Are you ready with the random element, Chris? I'm ready. Give me the countdown. And we'll we'll find out where we're going. All right. Let's have it happen in four, three, two, one. How dare you? Twenty-one. Twenty-one. It may, oh. it may listen to me. Oh no, it didn't. Uh, Just missed. It is the smugglers. Uh, and that's a seriously lost episode. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, all the episodes are missing. <laughs> uh this is actually and they have one... not been animated. No, no, they haven't. And mm -hmm. this is the episode that immediately precedes the tenth planet. Wow, the randomizer yeah. does love to bunch stuff up like that. We have this... done Huh, is this the first one of yeah, it's the first it's the first serial of season four of Doctor Who. Hmm. So this is this is right before Hartnell left the show. Yeah. And they were, I think, getting ready for him, his departure. And yeah. Oh my Wow, the randomizer does love Ben and Polly. <laughs> we've we've had quite a few of those. Um Yeah, that's gonna be interesting. Uh, I guess we're gonna have to do tally snaps. Uh or we'll see. Is there yeah. there is a target novelization by Terence Dix? I see. Maybe we'll have to read that from 1988. All right. Wow. Um, TBD. Yeah. Exactly how we encounter this one. The audio. Yeah. The audio is available somehow. Uh, I'm sure yeah. someone's done some tele snap stuff. We'll find it, and we will be back next week with the <laughs> our commentary on what remains of the smugglers. <laughs> <laughs> uh they're looking forward to this one guys this has been pull to open the podcast it's a podcast hey since we're a podcast why not subscribe to us that's what you do with podcasts in case you haven't already but even better go ahead and share this podcast with a friend of yours uh please also leave a review 
if you can in whatever podcast app that you use or a rating. Uh, if you're on YouTube, please drop us a line, but a like and a subscribe would do wonders as well as that bell icon that lets you get informed whenever we have new content. Go for that. Follow us on social, pull to open 63 on Twitter and Instagram and pull to open on TikTok. All right. We have killed the moon. We're going to do some <laughs> smuggling and we are going to sign off uh, until we see you next. That's right. We're going to smuggle some tardigrades onto the moon, uh, just as in real life and real science. So I guess that was the randomizer of reference, but we will see you all next week. Take care, everybody.